chat put them on the chat please post them in the chat box um, and we are very delighted to have our distinguished speaker today professor yusuf sabuti who is the head of uh, science branch of the iranian academy of sciences so I'll briefly introduce Professor Sabuti. Uh, he, Professor Sabuti studied physics in the University of Tehran and he went on to the University of Toronto to go, uh, get his MSc degree. Later in 1960, he went to the University of Chicago for a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics uh, under the renowned uh, physicist, uh, including Subramanian Chandraskar. In 1963, he took up a lecture position in Newcastle University in England. And he, Professor Buti, began his academic journey as an associate professor at Shiraz University. And during this tenure, he has played a pivotal role in shaping the modern university system in Shiraz. Um, he also led the foundation of the renowned Pironi Observatory in 1972, which remains the country's only functional center of its kind. Uh, in 1991, Professor Bhuti founded the Institute for Advanced Studies in Basic Sciences in Zanjan, IASBS, in short. So today, the ISP stands as one of the Iran's premier institutions for higher education, uh, with an imp impressive roster of over 1,000 graduates at the MSc and PhD levels. Professor Bhuti has published over 100 research, public, uh, research articles in peer-reviewed international journals, and he has supervised more than 50 graduate scholars. So we are grateful to Professor Bhuti for this opportunity. And over to you, Professor Bhuti. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, Dr. Khalil Reza. I'm honored to be in uh, your first speaker in this ECO SF conference. And uh, good morning to my colleagues from the different countries, beginning from Azerbaijan to Kazakhstan to uh, Turkey, I, I think you mentioned, and Pakistan and all other places. Uh, the title I have uh, given to you is uh, Three Arguable Concepts in Physics. But uh, after seeing that your conference is mainly for popularization of science, I thought that uh, all audience may not be uh, physicists or mathematicians. And therefore I, I am giving you another uh, lecture understanding others the science way. And this is actually uh, in the lecture I had given in 2017 in Paolo Bodinic science diplomacy lectures. Uh, so I will spend the 40 minutes time, 45 minutes time, which I have almost half and half this article understanding others the essence of the science way and the other the other half the title that i have originally given to your conference three arguable concepts in physics <clears throat> let me go to Astronomy is a study of the skies, is, is, as a study of the skies became an evidence-based science from the time of Hipparchus and Ptolemy through observations of the motion of the heavenly bodies. The inquisitive man understood the order prevailing in the skies and was able to predict some astronomical conditions, oppositions, tides, etc., with astonishing precision. Similarly, the ancient Euclidean geometry, born out of the everyday practices in building construction and land, land surveying, became axiomatic at about the same time. No one 
uh, this is the point I want to uh, uh, emphasize. No one disputed the legitimacy of these two disciplines for the purpose they were taught and learned in any language by anyone of any cultural, ethical, and ethnic background. At no time or place did their tenets become sanctified, nor were any of their advocates and practitioners promoted to the status of sainthood. The two disciplines emerged as two time-free, geography-free, ethic and ethnic-free intellectual construction of man's mind as early as 20 centuries ago. This and, and this endowed the discipline with a building mechanism to reconcile differences among the experts. One could convince or be convinced by one's fellow practitioner through logical mathematical reasoning or turn to observations as the supreme arbitrator. Unlike astronomy and geometry, many other topics in the treasure house of humanity, human body, of uh, knowledge had to wait for hundreds of years to attain an acceptable level of clarity. Axiomatization of physics begins with Galileo and Newton in the 16th and 17th centuries, and it still is being revised and refined. Chemistry and biosciences are still in their infancy. Economics, medicine, social and, and behavioral sciences and the like have at most emerged as empirical chapters in the human body of knowledge. There also exists a long list of creeds and credos that may never become evidence-based and contained to, to deserve the title of science. Almost all age-old human beliefs of metaphysical origin fall in this category. Evidence-based sciences draw their credence from the compatibility of their conclusions and predictions from observations. Opinion-based doctrines and creeds draw support from the prestige of so and social eminence of their authors and the community of their followers. And the point I want to emphasize are these two uh, items. Evidence-based sciences draw their credence from the compatibility of their conclusions and predi predictions from observations. Opinion-based doctrines and creeds draw support from the prestige of social eminence of their authors and the community of their followers. <clears throat> Please note these two characteristics of the exact sciences and opinion-based sciences. Examples, credibility of Newton's law of motion comes from the everyday practices in ballistic technology, that of Maxwell equations from the TV radio communication technologies, that of quantum mechanics from the spectroscopy of atoms of molecules. Their validity is not hinged with the names of Newton, Maxwell, Schrodinger, or Heisenberg, who are undoubtedly among the most prestigious peers 
and pillars of the modern philosophical views of August Kant, Francis Bacon, Hegel, Bernard Shaw, or in contemporary times with the economic, social, and political views of the columnists of The Guardian, New York Times, François Corriere de la Serra, etc. Such points of view are credible not because they have been proven to be the ultimate truth, but because they are authored by the great thinkers of their times. A second characteristic of uh, uh, science, evidence-based and opinion-based. A second characteristic to note, names and ideas associated with evidence-based sciences remain earthly. They can be refuted with no risk of consequential retribution. This is not always the case with the opinion-based knowledge. There the ideas may get sanctified and become faith-like beliefs. And authors of the ideas may become unapproachable. Karl Marx and his views on capitalism in the Soviet era in the first in the East and to a lesser extent, the notion of democracy and human rights in present times in the West fall in these categories. As such, evidence-based sciences have a built-in provision for solution of conflicts, while the opinion-based creeds nurture the seeds of controversy. Confronted with opposing views, they look for support from followers, patrons, and patron institutions. The outcome may not always be peaceful. Let's look at some tragic historical and contemporary evidences. I'm skipping uh, uh, in these two paragraphs going to here. Throughout history, such episodes have repeated themselves. The pattern is always the same. Two, two factions oppose each other over a vaguely conceived cause, such as religious teachings, a social view, value, a moral code of conduct, a philosophical doctrine, or a material interest. Opponents don't find a common ground to settle disputes and resort to the zeal of their followers. Let's consider examples from the Muslim world. In the in the flourishing era from the 8th through 12th centuries, Abu Nasr Farabi and Abu Ali Sina were undoubtedly the greatest philosophers of their times, as well as devout Muslims. Abu Hamid Ghazali, an equally renowned thinker and theologian, was, however, in odds with philosophy and philosophers. He maintained that the teaching of philosophers, including mathematics, weakened the pillars of faith. He announced Farabi, Abu Ali, or for that matter, all philosophers heretics. Fortunately, the Islamic societies in their economically and politically booming times between the 8th and 12th centuries were tolerant enough to let the verdict pass, pass by without incident. Azali's 
def defiance of philosophy and free thinking did, however, leave long lasting effects. The great theologian, theologian had zealous fellow followers amongst elites and commoners. They eventually succeeded in curbing the tradition of the free thinking and accelerated the decline of the Islamic societies. Let's proceed to the 16th and 7th centuries Europe. The Ptolemaic ge geocentric models of the universe combined with the Aristotelian point of view that man stood second to the Almighty in honor had put the earth in a noble position in the scheme of creation. Somehow, this notion had worked its way into the teaching of the church. Taking the earth out of the center of the creation was a sacrilegious act. Copernicus, fearing his fellow theologians, chose to postpone the publication of his heliocentric theory to the very last day of his life in 1543. Galileo was wise enough to deny altogether the motion of the earth and escape persecution. Giordano Bruno was not so fortunate. He was burned at the stake because he had advocated that there might be an infinite number of worlds in the intelligent, with intelligent beings. By the 21st century, many of the natural human social sciences have achieved access acceptable level of clarity and their practitioners have learned to reconcile differences through sober dialogue. This is a welcome development. There are, however, many global issues that are not yet cast into satisfactorily objective terms. And there remains issues that may never be viewed as objective ones. Topics such as economics, governance, human rights, ethics, social mores, international relations, peace and war, and many others fall in this category. Indispensable as they are in the everyday life, they do not have concise and contained definitions and founding principles to fit into the hallmark of the modern science. They may mean different things to different people of different cultures, times, and spaces, and places. At times, they may become sources of conflict, maybe naively. However, I maintain that the tradition of modern science can help resolve or at least ameliorate conflict as well. I believe that life will be much easier if the majority of the population of the world subscribe to not to present not presenting one's belief as evidence of one's righteousness and not considering any concept sacred, no matter how widely popular in it may be. Strict observations of such seemingly simple criteria is in non-scientific cases is not easy. A, a conscious effort 
to adhere to them, however, should be rewarding and help one better understand the others. Um, from this uh, writing, I'm stopping here. So what I wanted to convey is that uh, the human body of knowledge, I'm, uh, I'm uh, grouping it under the title of evidence-based and opinion-based knowledge. Evidence-based knowledge is uh, conflict-free. It is religion-free. It's geographical-free. It is ethnic and ethic-free. Opinion-based uh, body of knowledge does not have these characteristics. They, in different places, they, in, in different cultures, they might mean different things. If two practitioners in exact sciences, in evidence-based uh, sciences, uh, have differences in their opinion, they can sit down, argue according to the axioms that they have accepted. And still, if they could not agree with each other, the supreme arbitrator is the laboratory observations. This is not the case with opinion-based body of knowledge. Opinion-based body of knowledge draws its credentials from the name of the authors of those knowledge. And their supporters are the common people who believe uh, that may be at times be able to, to simply to convince their opponents uh, take irrational actions. This is my opinion. Um, this is my word on the characteristics of opinion-based and evidence-based uh, knowledge. I'm stopping here and going to my uh, PowerPoints, three arguable concepts. Uh, this is, uh, in this article, it is published in, can you change it? This is my latest, uh, 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 article on, on physics, he, um, maybe uh, you know that Dr. Khalil Reza, in my introduction to you said, I'm uh, practically a, a, an educator. I have in in university life for 60 years and uh, teaching from mechanics to electromagnetism to quantum mechanics special and general relativities and throughout these uh, uh, years I have come to Note that there are certain inadequate inadequacies in the the, in the courses we teach in the universities, uh, and I have in this article, which is published in uh, in Quantum Studies, Fun Quantum Sciences Foundations and Mathematics. 
and I have dedicated this article to the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. And in the main article is in 2022 in the, in the Journal of Quantum Studies. Uh, the three points which I'm going to discuss, point particle singularity, asymmetric action of electromagnetism on quantum wave functions, and also a lift out Lorentz gauge from U1 symmetry. How do I change this? How do I change this? Oh. Let's look at this uh, Newton's gravitation. Newton's gravitation, G M by R, or Coulomb's law, Q divided by R. In these two, uh, very honorable laws. One tacitly assumes that there is a finite mass or electric charge packed in a zero volume. This concept is singular and entails singularities and divergences. See what I'm saying? Uh, this M here or Q here, it is assumed that in these two laws, it is assumed that it is a point particle. There exists something, an entity with zero volume, but with finite mass or finite charge. This is not a an acceptable physical idea. That's what I'm objecting to uh, this law. Moreover, there is another uh, uh, tacit assumption. Uh, that assumption is that you can measure the coordinates of this point particle with uh, infinite precision and put it at some point, for instance, at the center of your coordinate system, R equals zero. And you can approach infinitely closely to this uh, point mass, and then R becomes zero, this quantity diverges. The concept is singular and singular and entails singularities. This concept is in conflict with the founding principles of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics says has an uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle says the, that no physical entity can have precisely defined positions. You cannot define a precise position to any physical entity. For instance, an electron. You cannot uh, say that this electron is exactly at the center of coordinate r equals zero. Not only that, principle of uncertainty says you cannot say that electron, that point is exactly motionless. That is, uh, pre let me read it again. It is in conflict with the foundations of Founding principles of quantum mechanics, namely with the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, that no physical entity can have precisely defined positions and or momentum. Momentum meaning that 
it is motion, uh, it, the, the, the amount of motion, uh, but it is moving or not. What to do? Uh, the second no two in quantum mechanics. I hope most of our audiences are familiar with Schrodinger's equation or Dirac wave equation. For instance, a hydrogen atom, one electron circling a proton. A proton has electric, exerts an electric field on the electron. And then Schrodinger equation is a wave equation. And there is an associated quantum wave with the electron. Uh, what I would like to emphasize in Schrodinger equation, there are two fields, the electric field of both hydrogen, of both electron and proton. And also electron has a quantum wave field, EM field and quantum wave field. In Schrodinger equation, EM field enters the Schrodinger equation, but EM field are obtained from Maxwell's equations. In Maxwell equations, there is no quantum wave in it. Maxwell's equations are classical equations for electromagnetism. This classical electromagnetism enters the quantum mechanics, but quantum mechanics does not enter the classical electromagnetic field. This I call a symmetric role of EM on quantum wave functions. And I am referring to a quotation from Einstein when Einstein was formulating his general relativity um, he says he has this saying in his book on the meaning of relativity it is contrary to the mode of thinking in science to conceive of a thing that acts itself, but which cannot be acted upon. In fact, uh, we have this uh, law of action reaction in Newton's uh, teachings. We learn Newton's mechanics in high schools. And one of the laws that Newton's in 17th century says is that uh, if object A acts on object B, object B reacts on object A, and this action reaction. Um, what Einstein says here is a generalization of action reaction principle to the space-time structure and also its uh, energy momentum content. Einstein in building general relativity says the evolution of energy momentum is happening in space-time. Space-time governs the fate of the energy momentum, content of the space-time. Why the energy momentum 
should not react on the space time. Space time we usually consider is the Euclidean three dimensional X, Y, Z uh, space, and also the time added to it. And if uh, one is familiar with the special relativity, space, space time of special relativity is the, uh, let me see if I remember the name. And I will remember that until you later. Uh, what Einstein says here, a space-time structure should be distorted by the presence of the energy momentum tensors. Space does not remain Euclidean and time does not remain a scalar. The space-time around the sun, for instance, as a material body, is not a Euclidean space-time. Um, and it is the reaction of space-time, it is the reaction of uh, the energy momentum on the structure of space-time. This is the teaching of Einstein I have uh, quoted here. And I want to generalize this to say that in quantum mechanics, if electromagn classical electromagnetic fields enters the quantum mechanics in Schrodinger's equation or in Dirac wave equation, wave equation of Schrodinger or Dirac should enter the Maxwell's equations to, uh, to think like Einstein. So I am saying that a la Einstein, let's propose a mutual action reaction partnership between electromagnetism and quantum waves. By so doing, Quantum wave shares its non-localized nature with electromagnetism, removes the singularities, maybe a simple, a simpler and more palatable alternative to quantum electrodynamics. Let me explain this uh, once more. Maxwell's equations has Coulomb's law in it. Coulomb's law I uh, showed you. Uh, a charge Q creates an electric field Q divided by R, electric potential. Electric force Q divided by R squared. The point particle is that in this uh, Coulomb's law. So Maxwell equations is singular. On the other hand, Schrodinger equation or the Dirac equation, quant which are quantum mechanical, they deal with quantum wave field. A wave field is not localized concept. It is a distributed concept. And if we propose mutual action reaction partnership between electromagnetism and quantum wave, then quantum wave shares its non-localized nature with electromagnetism and removes the singularity, uh, which is the singularity in the Coulomb's law. And then, uh, all divergent integrals which one observes in quantum electrodynamics, by so doing, they get disappeared. Um, 
This is the third questionable concept with which I put my finger on. There is a U1 symmetry in uh, electromagnetism and in quantum mechanics. This U1 symmetry says, conventional U1 symmetry says, leaves quantum dynamics invariant under a general Lorentz gauge and imposes the standard minimal coupling of quantum wave to the electromagnetic wave. Uh, this vector potential A mu enters Schrodinger equation and also can enter uh, Dirac equation for electron. Uh, this uh, U1 symmetry can be enlarged, and I'm not going uh, to uh, uh, take time to explain it. Uh, the conclusion is not only vector potential should enter the Schrodinger equation, also the derivatives of the vector potential should enter, and this enlarges the U1 symmetry. And then we have one Noether's theorem. If there is a symmetry anywhere, there should be a constant of motion. And therefore, if I am enlarging this U1 symmetry, means I am ad adding at a conserved quantity, which is not already explained uh, in the study of electron. I'm not going uh, to go uh, uh, through these equations, but uh, uh, let me uh, explain what picture of electron I am presenting by these uh, uh, tedious mathematical formulas. Um, in, in high school physics, when uh, we introduce electron, we say electron is a charged particle with, is, is, with so much charge, so much mass, and the charge creates an electric field. And the charge in classical electron is localized at one point. But if I uh, say that cannot be localized, it means a, a, a quantum electron has a distributed charge. It's not a point charge. On the other hand, Dirac tells us that electron has spin. Dirac and Pauli say that electron has a spin. Spin means electron is not a standing sphere at one place. It rotates around itself. But then if a charge a distributed charge rotates about itself. Maxwell's equations tell us that it creates an electric current, a circular electric current. But then if there is an electric circular current, another law of electromagnetism, Maxwell's equation say, there must be a magnetic field as well. So the description from the electron I get, I can uh, summarize by saying that electron is a charged particle. The charge is distributed. It's not a point like. This distributed charge spins around itself, 
therefore creates a magnetic field. Therefore, it is also a magnetic dipole as well. So in my description, uh, if I want to teach electron in high school, I will, from now on, I will say, electron is a charged particle. It has a distributed charge. It is spins, therefore has an electric dipole as well. This electric dipole can be uh, observed in the laboratory. It has a anomalous G factor given by this expression. Alpha is fine structure constant. This comes from the ordinary minimal coupling. This term comes from what I'm proposing here. The laboratory measurement of G factor is this one. Uh, this is my theoretical value. This is the measured laboratory value. And I'm taking this one over three is 0.333. Laboratory measured value is 0.325. Uh, this is uh, the, the laboratory support that I am uh, saying that this agreement between these two values supports what I'm saying. I stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm ready to take questions if there are any. Dr. Reza Khalili. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Sabuti, for such an excellent talk. Um, both one on the, it was more of an, a generalized <laughs> talk. And I was quite uh, inspired by the way you presented the two bodies of knowledge. One is the evidence-based and another is opinion-based. And the distinctions that you made in terms of the uh, specific characteristics between these two bodies of knowledge, those were quite interesting. Now, uh, I'll open the floor and if any of the participants has any question for Professor Subhuti, please uh, either you turn on your mic and speak directly to Professor Tayyibi, or Professor Subhuti, or you can put it in the chat box. Uh, so, Professor Subhuti, I think meanwhile we uh, get any question from the audience. Uh, you know, it was quite interesting to take note of the two concepts that you mentioned, the evidence-based and uh, opinion -based. the opinion-based. So, I, I think in terms of the way that the human mind forms any conclusion about any aspect of the knowledge. Hmm. I think, isn't it more important that the, the formal training, education, grooming brought up the, that go into developing of a human mind that shapes them to think in that particular way? How uh, how would you rate the the formal education and the parental guidance in developing uh, such a mind? Okay. Uh, you see, uh, the, the modern uh, observation-based sciences uh, have a history of... Uh, almost 300 years by now. Uh, as I emphasized, uh, the observation-based sciences 
are conflict free and uh, they teach people to sit down and discuss and uh, reconcile their differences with logics and axioms which is acceptable to both sides. This char characteristics is not in the uh, uh, opinion-based uh, uh, body of knowledge. But uh, when you uh, educating school children and grown-ups in evidence-based sciences, people get acquainted with the technique of reconciling differences. It shortens the domain of opinion-based sciences. It helps the others also to uh, uh, be uh, more sober in their uh, resolving their uh, uh, the, the differences. In my opinion, if uh, observation-based, opinion, uh, uh, evidence-based sciences uh, gets developed one step forward, the opinion-based body of knowledge recedes one step back. Uh, as some hundred years ago, uh, Christians and Muslims were in were f some uh, several hundred years back. Christians and Muslims were fighting each other over their beliefs in religion. This is not the case at present time, at least not to the extent, not to the level of harshness that uh, were practiced in crusade wars uh, uh, some centuries ago. I think this is the uh, grace of the uh, evidence-based sciences, which uh, a majority of uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews and Buddhists uh, have gotten acquainted with, and they are able now to tolerate each other more than our fathers, grandfathers, grand grandfathers were able to do it. That's my answer to it. If uh, observation-based sciences, if uh, evidence-based sciences develop one step forward, opinion-based knowledge recedes back one step backward. That's my answer to your questions. Right. Uh, so far, I think we, we have not received any question from the audience in the chat box, but I would encourage anyone who has any uh, question for Professor Bhuti, please do so. And uh, uh, Professor Bhuti, if, if we talk about the climate change, now there are a large majority of scientists, uh, they believe that the evidence that's available in terms of the quantitative modeling, uh, in terms of the carbon emissions and the correspond. Uh, so there, there's an evidence that a lot of scientists, a large body of scientists believe that. Uh, but uh, uh, there are still some scientists who have some hard time or difficulty in, so they say that the evidence is not conclusive enough. Uh, Even among the scientists, okay. there. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, the uh, science of climate uh, is is a is a very complex science. Uh, my answer to uh, your question is that we still don't know how many factors 
in, in, in Bobara Biot, how many factors uh, we have to consider to understand uh, the climate change. If you wish, Khalili Rububina. Well, well. Uh, if you wish, I uh, would say that we still don't understand uh, 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 climate, science, uh, climate science uh, as clearly as we understand, for instance, uh, classical mechanics or Maxwell's equations or quantum mechanics. Uh, all uh, we have to do to wait uh, and see what uh, will happen in the next few years, how much, uh, how much further we can proceed in understanding the roots of the climate change. So my, uh, therefore, there are conflicts in it, and most of the conflicts are economic conflicts for uh, and certain. Uh, uh, commercial companies, and also uh, their influence on the uh, politics and uh, uh, and also the politicians that sometimes you see. For instance, um, you see the politicians in different places uh, are among the opponents, but their supporters are the big companies which have material interest uh, in coal mining, in the oil uh, 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 refineries, and so on and so forth. In, in fact, in my uh, the division of uh, body of knowledge into evidence-based and opinion-based, uh, let me say that climate change is partially opinion-based and partially evidence-based, acceptable for some group and unacceptable for the others. Right, Professor Bhuti, I think you have uh, concluded very well in terms of uh, why there has not been consensus uh, yeah. among this uh, topic, though that's been uh, uh, debated quite widely uh, earlier, yeah. it was not that uh, high in the momentum, but now we see in every corner of uh, you know debate, the climate change is uh, uh, it takes yeah. a greater place. So climate is changing. You see, everyone uh, uh, accepts that climate is warming up. Uh, there is no dispute on it. Whether it is because of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or not, this is uh, the opponents argue on the suspect. And then don't forget the uh, role of the coal miners and also oil companies. Right, uh, I think uh, this comes to an end of uh, this session. Thank you very much. We are so grateful uh, for your time for presenting, you. Uh, you know, both. So you covered the both aspects, the talk for <laughs> the general audience, and that was excellent, right. and also for the mathematicians. So Thank I see you very the, much. Uh, the, yeah, uh, you know, we we're so grateful. And then uh, we, I see- uh, Someone from the audience has a question. All right, so, yeah. Ghazaleh has a question. She has written. Yeah. She she has asked it. Can you please talk about the possible of connection of quantum physics and electronics? Quantum physics and electronics, they are almost the same. Quantum Ooh. physics, quantum physics nowadays uh, is uh, with the uh, with the uh, increasing capacity of uh, computers to deal with larger body of uh, uh, data, quantum mechanics is becoming more and more 
uh, topics of science and technology. Uh, in, in the last uh, four, 10 years, I should say, in the past 10 years, you see quantum computing, quantum technology, and many other things. It will be uh, heightened and heightened uh, day by day. And uh, let's wait and see what uh, we have, what, what both uh, through the theoreticians and technologists will have to offer in the next few years. Right, and I think uh, there's a, another question uh, from Javeya Shah. You may have already covered it. So she asked that how can the scientific community reconcile conflicting interpretations of quantum mechanics when the evidence is not conclusive? For quantum mechanics? Yes. <laughs> if you didn't have quantum mechanics, uh, there are very con conclusive uh, the, uh, uh, evidences for the correctness of quantum mechanics. Spectroscopy, uh, uh, atomic physics, nuclear physics, they uh, conclusively uh, uh, accept the correctness of quantum mechanics. I don't know uh, why our uh, dear audience says that the, the quantum mechanics is not conclusive. Quantum mechanics has uh, one concept which is not classical and when, which is hard to understand uh, the, 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 it's hard, hard, for, for the commoners, it's hard to understand it. That's a pro probabilistic aspects of quantum mechanics. Probabilistic accept, uh, uh, concept of quantum mechanics is not uh, uh, every is not an everyday uh, person's uh, 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 concept to, to to master it. Uh, you have to have. Uh, considerable experience with science and physics and technologies based on them and then to uh, to understand the probabilistic aspects of it. An ordinary person cannot, uh, it's not easy for him to understand. In fact, not all ordinary people, even for Einstein in in, in, in 1930s, wasn't easy to accept the probabilistic aspects of quantum mechanics. And therefore, he uh, wrote with his fellows uh, EPR, uh, Einstein, Rosen, and uh, who? And, and then uh, proposed uh, some uh, experiment which is in uh, nowadays uh, uh, is uh, falsifiable. I've forgotten the names. Uh, I cannot say more than that. Probably the concept of quantum mechanics is not easy, uh, easily understood by untrained people. But the technology is based on the same quantum mechanics. It has everyday use in your mobiles, in the uh, conversation we are having now through Zoom, uh, and so on and so forth. These are the evidences for the correctness of what quantum mechanics says. Thank you, Professor Sabuti. I think you beautifully put it that uh, though it's difficult to, or it's not difficult, it's challenging for even uh, the learned, uh, you know, members of the mm -hmm. scientific community. Uh, yeah. But the evidence is that uh, 
the, we, the overall idea is con conclusive based on the technological application that we used of the quantum mechanics. Okay. Uh, yes. I think we'll take last question. This is from Shaheed Benazi Bhutto University, Sharingal, Upper Deer. Uh, I, I think you would see that they, the entire class or faculty is present over there. I think they're there about over 25 to 30 percent in the classroom. So they've asked that I, uh, the major, tell us about the major contribution of mathematics and quantum mechanics. Oh, uh, if, 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 wasn't, if it wasn't the help of mathematicians, uh, Hilbert, Banach, uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 person uh, who gave advice to Einstein, uh, uh, the great mathematicians. If if if, if it wasn't for for mathematics, uh, we, the, the, the quantum mechanics would not have been able to develop. Uh, general relativity, especially relativity, wouldn't have been. Uh, if it wasn't for Raymond, uh, we did not have, Einstein wouldn't be able to uh, uh, formulate his uh, general relat relativity. If it wasn't for Minkowski, uh, for uh, the mathematics uh, of space-time, uh, uh, space-time structure, Minkowski wouldn't have been able Einstein wouldn't have been able to uh, formulate his special theory of relativity. These are uh, the inspirations uh, from mathematicians ha who had that has enabled physicists to uh, invent quantum mechanics, invent special relativity, invent uh, uh, general relativity. Right. Uh, and again, uh, uh, if Professor Rijali, do you have any comment? Because you are our major partner in hosting this uh, session today. If you'd like to say no, something. Thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Sobuti, for uh, the informative talks that you had. It was a pleasure uh, for okay. me. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating uh, in the session. So I'll, I think I'll conclude and I'll request uh, President uh, Economic Cooperation Organization Science Foundation, ECUSF, Professor Sayed Kumail Tayyibi, uh, to please join in and uh, present his concluding and thanking note. Professor Tayyibi, are you there, sir? How many audience you had? How many people at, uh, were present in this uh, lecture? I, I think the, idea? The, the peak that we received because some of the people joined and then left. So on average, I think we had uh, 40 participants at the peak mm. uh, online. And then we have uh, a full class of students and faculty from Shahid Benazir Bhutto University. Of Adi. I think mm. they are also about 30, uh, 30 to 35, I, I, I guess. Geographically? So Geographical distribution? Uh, th th that's too yeah. early to say because I think <laughs> we'll, we'll have to run the, uh, mm. you know, some insights after this is done. So we'll be able to figure it out. So we'll let you know. Now it's uh, time for Professor Tayyabi, who is also from Iran. Uh, okay. Please welcome. Uh, Good morning, Professor so, Taibbi. Over to you, Professor Taibbi. Good morning, Taibbi. and here I have to say good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Professor Sobuti, uh, of course, distinguished professor uh, of science and the head of uh, science branch of the Iranian Academy of Science. Uh, actually, uh, I enjoyed a lot, and I'm sure uh, other participants enjoyed too. Uh, because you raise your, you know, some conceptual uh, issues regarding, you know, science, as I understood, and as my uh, major is uh, economics, I learn actually something, you know, when when you raise uh, 
uh, uh, raise about uh, you know human body of knowledge as uh, Khalid Reza already mentioned evidence based knowledge and opinion based knowledge and that was you know a lesson for a lesson I hope for... I didn't offend the economists <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right, right. And I, you know, I, I understood I should follow, you know, uh, more the opinion, opinion based knowledge regarding uh, analytical uh, economic yes. issues to hopefully for solving socio society and the, the economy totally. So mm. I would like to thank you again. Uh, just uh, very interesting uh, discussion, very interesting speech you have, and this is uh, uh, as a result of you know cooperation between uh, the Institute of Science Foundation and also Isfahan Mathematics House and uh, of yes. course the Iranian Academy of Science. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, it is for the uh, first point of our collaboration in this uh, in this respect. And uh, as you uh, you mentioned in different uh, different issues, uh, to be uh, I think discussed to be presented hopefully in in the future. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rejali, his team from Isfahan Mathematics House and other colleagues uh, from the Iranian Academy of Science. And uh, also I would like to thank uh, Mr. Khalil Reza, uh, our program manager at the ECO Science Foundation and the team just uh, to for, you know, deliver uh, this very interesting um, event uh, for today. Uh, as the result of collaboration between, um, and also I would like to thank to all participants, uh, especially from uh, Shahid uh, Binazirbut University. Just uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, just uh, we have them at the class, a um, number of uh, faculty members and uh, maybe students. And I ask, and I uh, again invite you, uh, you know, for further, hopefully, a, a speech uh, in the future, and also invite mathematics, Isfahan Mathematics House, and my colleagues at the uh, ECO Science Foundation to have, you know, more webinars. Uh, on different issues uh, just you raised in this morning and this afternoon regarding you know science technology regarding uh, climate change economics political and social sciences and whatsoever so uh, once again uh, i thank to all and uh, khalid is the floor is yours if you want to have something more to mention about this very great event today. Thank you. I think uh, that's all, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, grateful, thankful to all the participants uh, and Professor Rijali, uh, Professor Tayyabi, and undoubtedly Professor Sabuti, because he has put in a lot of hard work and uh, he has put in his 60 years of experience, uh, you know, sharing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very insightful and we we look forward to stay connected and continue to interact with Professor Sabuti as part of the uh, mass popularization program or initiative that's been uh, launched with the help of and partnership of uh, mm -hmm. Union of Iranian Mathematical Societies. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I think this comes to an end of this uh, first lecture series. And uh, will, uh, if you have any idea or if you would like to suggest uh, any speaker that you would like to participate and you would like to gain some insight from uh, that particular instructor, professor, uh, you know, please, uh, you know, give us your suggestion uh, through our uh, email. You, you already have my email, k.reza at ecsf.org. So that's all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much and have Thank a you. good day. Good day.